overall interest uh, of which, in, in which this is set is about how to think about the self, the human self, and technology. I'm interested in the ways that the way we consider ourselves to be helps make possible certain kinds of technology and how those technologies then act back on us to transform us, like the Rorschach test. What did we have to believe about ourselves to even imagine that these blots on a piece of paper could tell us about our innermost selves to be, as they said in the 1920s, x-rays of the soul. And so it goes through a series of other interactions between the self and technology that I'm trying to pursue in a book called Building Crashing Thinking. And it was thinking about these sorts of questions that led me to wonder about the problem of nuclear waste, how this stuff, this residue of the manufacture of nuclear weapons, for example, um, could lead us to ask questions about how we govern ourselves, who's responsible, who gets to vote about where this waste goes, for example, uh, or how, what responsibilities we might have towards generations unborn for 100, 200, 400, or more generations into the future. But let me talk about that in more detail. One of the ways we think about the relationship of wastelands and wilderness is a kind of conception that puts wastelands as the most destroyed and defiled form of land that we can come across. And wilderness to be the ideal of purity, of sanctity, of finding a place, as Thoreau and others thought, where we can rejuvenate the soul, where we can find ourselves in contact with our religiously based best first nature. That idea of a spectrum that goes in a linear way from the destroyed to the pure um, is partly related to the way we see ourselves in relationship to the land. Are we owners of the land? Is it given to us, as some people have interpreted the Bible to say, for its exploitation? Or, or, or is it the case that we are part of the land, servants to the land, as the romantics would have had it? What I think is happening now is something very strange in the relationship to land, especially land that has been covered with radioactive material, in which these two sides are bent back to touch each other, to be, in a sense, a kind of waste wilderness. And I want to describe some of what that means uh, in, 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 in this lecture. But let me go back to something less abstract and um, much more of immediate concern. Hanford was where about a third of the plutonium was produced for the American nuclear weapons program in Washington state. About two thirds was produced in a place we'll discuss much more in South Carolina called this, the, uh, known as SRS, the Savannah River site. But these, this waste is, you take the rods from a nuclear reactor and you dump them in huge vats of nitric acid uh, that is boiling and use that liquid to separate out the plutonium to make weapons with. But it leaves an enormous stream of liquid waste that's extremely radioactive and extremely toxic. So it was located in these giant million gallon tanks, something the size of the Capitol Dome, if you could imagine that, flipped upside down in a steel single or double uh, shelled casing. The problem is they've already begun to leak into the, into the Columbia River. And one of the great problems for handling nuclear waste is what to do with the 177 of those million gallon tanks at Hanford or the 50 or so that are located in Savannah River. It looks like this from the, from the, from the sky. Um, and even that, however problematic they are, is better than what was often done with nuclear waste, which was simply to put it in 50-gallon drums and dump it over the side of a hill. The nuclear weapons complex, and that only accounts for part of the world's uh, nuclear waste. Much comes from the nuclear power plants. But the nuclear weapons, as you can see, were manufactured from coast to coast, from north to south, as each part of this process that took from mining uh, and refining and sh shaping and the metallurgy and all the, all, all the processes up to and including testing the nuclear weapons. Or you could think of the waste in political economic terms by looking at where it is and what that means for uh, the different parts of the country, or indeed the world. This map, for example, shows in a distended way where the, the area of a, of a country indicates its uh, 
nuclear waste content. And you can see here that France, for instance, is about the same size as the United States because about 80% of French electricity is produced from nuclear power. And they, have an, they had an active nuclear weapons program as well. And even though they have about a fourth or fifth the population, that's about four or five times the 20% or, or so of American electrical power that's produced uh, from, uh, nu from nuclear sources. You can see China uh, growing here, Japan uh, in large as well. Canada is a substantial c contributor and so on. So th this kind of waste has then has to be handled. And one of the most extraordinary pieces of legislation took place uh, some years ago when Congress of the United States specified that the Department of Energy would be responsible for taking care of nuclear waste for a period of at least 10,000 years. Now, 10,000 years, just to fix ideas, 10,000 years ago, Stonehenge was 4,000 years in the future. Stonehenge was science fiction distance in the future. Uh, so it's uh, 400 or so generations. It's twice recorded human history. It's an amount of time that neither law nor our other institutions nor our imagination are quite ready uh, to address. But when it came time to discuss where nuclear power waste would go, Yucca Mountain was the candidate site after a rather uh, abortive uh, political process in which other competing sites were simply withdrawn because the states were more powerful than the state, inclu including Yucca Mountain. Uh, the people who, who had to consider this from the National Academy of Sciences said, look, the peak radiation from this waste uh, won't occur uh, for hundreds of thousands of years. In fact, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. You need about 10 half-lives to get down to a thousandth the strength of current levels. So that's about um, 10 half-lives times 24,000 years is 240,000 years. And then it decays into uh, another radioactive material, uranium-235, which uh, has an even longer half-life. So what this meant was that they required not 10,000 years, but a million years. Now, a million years ago, we weren't us. <laughs> we were, or to the extent that we, <laughs> we show up there, it's as some possible descendant of Homo ergoster. So when we look at, ten, at a million years in the future, we're not even looking at a human future in any guaranteed way. Now, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, who you may remember uh, for other <laughs> reasons, um, was against the idea that you should bury the waste in a reversible way. He, uh, he wanted to be, to be buried forever, he said, uh, in French parliament. If 500, 1,000, or 2,000 years from now, we want to avoid having some terrorist of the time retrieving that waste for criminal purposes, it is no aberration to think that if it is to be buried, it should be irreversibly buried, meaning in such a way that no one would remember exactly where the sites are. Well, he lost that battle, and the French have been militating for the idea that we should be able to retrieve the waste, because we shouldn't make decisions for the future that they might want to undo. We shouldn't make a decision irreversibly. So each generation should be able to extract the waste, do something else with it, rebury it, repackage it, or do some other feature. Now, it's very interesting that the French and the Americans have such opposite perspectives on this. The French, who have had, uh, along with the rest of Europe, a highly tumultuous political past over the last hundred years, two world wars, it is the fifth republic after, after all since uh, the 18th century, should trust in political continuity, but not trust uh, uh, the scientific uh, account of what will be secure, the scientific technical account of what a secure way to bury the waste would be, whereas the Americans who've had a longer period of uh, political continuity, um, don't trust the political future, and absolutely want the waste to be buried in the most irretrievable way possible. So you have different approaches, but they're in fact maybe closer than you might think, because a few hundred years, or 100 to 200, 300 years possibly, is about as far ahead as the technical abilities of our, of our encasements are good to hold things. So what the French, actually say is you take these extremely crafted uh, titanium alloy tanks and maybe you can hold them reversible for a couple of hundred years and then see what happens after that. 
The issue of nuclear waste has uh, brought governments down. In Sweden, it's been a huge issue over uh, the last decades. In Germany, the protests at the Salt Dome at Gorleben were led to furious and violent protests every two years for the last couple of decades. Uh, it's been a major source of contention. The sites in Germany were largely put where they were at the old East German, West German boundary for political reasons is in a kind of revenge action against East German location of uh, dumps and other things near that border too, but not for very good geological reasons. Sweden had many attempts to locate their waste fail. Uh, they eventually got a solution to it when two towns volunteered and competed, in fact, for the waste, both of them already nuclear sites. Uh, and the idea of the state was that they would give more money to the loser of that competition because the winner, the one that got the actual waste, would get presumably get the economic benefits from having a major income flow to them uh, for this large-scale industrial process. In the United States, the New Mexico uh, won this kind of struggle. And a site near Carlsbad in the southeast corner of the state, part of the conservative, New Mexico is divided politically between a kind of more heterogeneous and uh, politically left liberal north and a much more conservative part over the panhandle of Texas in the southeast. And in the southeast, this became a huge uh, economic possibility in a region that was suffering hugely from the collapse of their potash mining and other local industries. The idea was to dig into the salt about half a mile underground uh, and to extract that space to, to make these galley, galleries, so to speak, and they would place the waste in them. So the government withdrew 16 square miles of land from, as they said, all forms of entry, appropriation, and disposal under the public land laws. And they said that this land must be surrounded by a land withdrawal boundary, active, which meant people that would you know, respond with armed force if people tried to get in, and passive measures such as archives and markers. As long as the plant is operating, there are SWAT teams that go around. I mean, we, Rob and I know this very well because we were filming there. If we said, you promise we're going to film here this afternoon, that's OK. Yes, that's OK. We're going to be there. You're not going to shoot us. No, we're not going to shoot you. Uh, we started to film. This truck comes up with these guys with you know, bulletproof vests and machine guns. And they say, you know, what are you doing here? We said, well, they told us, <laughs> your bosses told us we could film here. And they, they had a lot of phone calls back and forth. And finally, they decided uh, that we were OK. So they're at, at the moment, if you go near these sites, they're protected by active measures. But the site will close in 20 or 30 or 40 years. Years, and when that happens, it'll be abandoned. And no one wants to guard, pay for guards and guard dogs to patrol an area where nothing happens for 400 generations. So the question is, how are you going to warn the future about this uh, problem? Well, wh who thinks about the distant future? Who tries to predict the future of, of conflict or things going wrong in different ways. The field of futurist studies really becomes active in the period of nuclear hydrogen bomb weapon planning under Herman Kahn, who's the uh, model for Dr. Strangelove uh, in the film of that name. Um, because he began, his slogan was, we have to think the unthinkable. We have to figure out how to survive a nuclear war in various ways. And he began to invent these scenarios, these kind of movie scripts, ant anticipations of a movie script, little squibs that would describe something like what might happen. A bomb goes off in North Dakota at an Air Force base, a nuclear weapon goes off, what do you do? Or the Germans lose control over the full gap pass and, 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 the, and the Soviets bomb this area, what happens next? And so on. So these sort of short imaginary scenarios became part of the way a nuclear war was discussed. And he, this idea of scenario planning then spread to industry. Shell oil began to make scenarios. And so there were 
Kahn would publish lots of them. Some of them were based on fiction, some of them were based on historical events, some of them were based on kind of science fiction imaginaries of the future. Uh, here's a list of three, they go on for pages and pages, but Armageddon, the final battle between good and evil presaging the end of the world. Kamlan, King Arthur's final battle with Mordred, accidental start of a major conflict. The European peace from 1871 to 1914, the balance of power could fail in a hugely unlikely way. And then you would spin these out in different ways. For instance, one Soviet general says to uh, Khrushchev, so you see, if you press these 300 buttons, there is a good chance of our getting away scot-free, a small chance of our suffering moderate damage, and no chance at all of our suffering as much damage as we suffered in World War II. Khrushchev, the Americans are on a 15-minute alert. If they have any spies, or even if we have a defector, we will be destroyed. Soviet general, don't worry. I know that some Ukrainians are still harboring unjustified grievances against you. The Ukraine's been a contested territory for some time. There are no Ukrainians in this force. Every officer is married and has children. And we have told these officers that if they fire early, not only will they be shot, but their families will be severely punished. And so these, this kind of state fiction uh, became part of the planning process. And as they spread to places like NASA, oil companies, and others, one of the people who was a senior um, missile designer for NASA, worked on the Saturn V upper stage rocket, was Theodore Ted Gordon. And the Rand Corporation and others began to make predictions back in 1964 using a method of groups of people brainstorming together and thinking about what it meant to talk about the future. Now, they were talking about a future that was 6, 10, 15 years in the future. Establishment of a global satellite communication system. Unmanned inspection and capability for destruction of satellites. Manned co-orbital inspection of satellites. And then you see how much time they think it would take, what make comments. They looked at everything from birth control pills to uh, psychoactive drugs. They looked at all sorts of technology and tried to predict what the future might be like. So when they were called upon by the Department of Energy to imagine why would people in the future possibly dig into this massive amount of nuclear waste that's buried under the desert floor, um, what did they do? Well, they began, they brought, brought together semioticians, they brought together um, astronomers, physicists, metallurgists, material scientists, anthropologists, archaeologists. They looked at the deep past. They looked at pyramids. They looked at Stonehenge. They looked at the Acropolis. They looked at uh, all sorts of different ways that, uh, of trying to transmit a message and to imagine what the future might somehow be like 10,000 years in the future. And they thought it was, you'll see from the film clip that I'll, I'll show later before Rob and I begin our discussion about the film of this that they really, they, they thought it was wildly outscale from our abilities. Predicting five years or 10 years or 15 years, predicting 5,000 or 10,000 years was a horse of a very different color. The first scenario that they imagined uh, began by asking what current trend could lead people to see the markers, read them, understand them, and not believe them. And the very first one that they wrote down, this is 19, 1989-1990, published in 1991, was called The Feminist Dystopia. In 2091, men no longer dominated the corridors of power of the world. Masculine thinking, abstract and analytical thinking, quantification, objectivity, rationality, straightforwardness, clarity, concision, universality, modernity, mastery, domination, repression, and technical manipulation had been discredited, along with male aggressive epistemological arrogance. So the futuristas of this first scenario dug into the uh, waste site looking for potash and catastrophically released radionuclides. The second uh, scenario was called the Marcunians. Now the Marcunians is a combination of Herbert Marcuse and Thomas S. Kuhn. So feminists, historians of science, your real danger here. Uh, I feel <laughs> targeted. Um, the cult for uh, ex Marcuse and Kuhn read the warnings, again, they understood them, but dismissed them as the arbitrary creation of a particular group of scientists at a particular time in the past. And they then had to beat a hasty retreat when a radioactive geyser spewed up from the ground and they resettled in, and I'm not making this name up, it's there, check your atlas, truth or consequences, New 
Mexico and began once again to look for the long lost scrolls that they thought must be there. Now, there are many other scenarios, digging tunnels underground through the, that went through the site so they didn't see the markers on the surface. The markers get stolen. Catastrophic climate change takes place. There are all sorts of trying to take current trends and extend them wildly and asymptotically into the future. Now, there have been attempts to warn the far future before. One is a long chain of monuments that have been built for a thousand years uh, along the spine of Japan. Aniyashi uh, has one of those, and in it, uh, this, bu this beautiful monument says basically, uh, don't build below this monument. A tsunami reached this point. Your future happiness depends on listening to this monument. Uh, another group that was brought in to try to imagine the future and how to communicate with it were the people who did the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, people like Carl Sagan and the team under Frank Drake, uh, who tried to either signal actively to the outside galaxy or to search for signals coming in or to make this famous and beautiful golden record for the side of the Voyager spacecraft uh, that was supposed to communicate to uh, whoever might find it or whatever might find it. Uh, even a billion, two billion, five billion years from now. It would last, the designers expected on metallurgical grounds, longer than the Earth would circle the sun. There were disputes in the team. How do you dis communicate to the future with images? Should you, should you use language? Should you make a kind of Rosetta Stone? Should you, do you expect that intelligent beings have some kind of universality? Do you expect that humans have some kind of universal response to images. Um, Arrhenius Eibel Ibersfeld, for instance, uh, argued that uh, there were universally recognizable human facial expressions that would indicate, for instance, mournful, almost in tears, physically hurt, tormented, frightened, panicked, nauseated, bitter, that those things crossed cultures, times, and even civilizations, and that maybe you could use those. So they began to think about message kiosks and monuments. One of them was marked, danger, poisonous radioactive waste buried here. Do not dig or drill before AD 12,000. And then there were a series of ever increasingly detailed instructions from simply trying to say, this was human made, you don't want to be here, uh, to uh, designs, for instance, that indicated the rationality of the Cartesian grid pierced from below by something bad. Um, there were menacing earthworks, leaning stone spikes, uh, all sorts of different uh, designs by landscape architects who had learned from what was being done at the level of these scenarios to try to figure out how you could warn a future civilization so different from ours that we couldn't expect that they had language in common with us, or indeed almost any aspect of civilization. Um, one uh, that I particularly like is called Black Hole, which becomes so hot in the high desert sun that you wouldn't want to walk on it. This is undermined somewhat by the two figures walking on it. <laughs> Uh, another was called Forbidding Blocks, where someone stands in front contemplating this space that resembles a kind of a city uh, and yet uh, was uninhabitable, unfarmable, small, crowded spaces with alleys that you couldn't move easily or comfortably through. No doubt people at that time were looking at places like Spiral Jetty, which had been built by Robert Smithson in 1970. They were definitely looking at archaeological sites, trying to figure out what we, in fact, could understand from millennial, the millennial past, uh, from the pyramids, from Stonehenge, from the Acropolis. From the pyramids, for instance, they, it was quite clear to them that uh, you couldn't use valuable material. The marble cladding was stolen instantly by, by uh, the standards of the time since it was built. There used to be gold decorative structures on the top. Those were stolen even more quickly. Stonehenge we can barely interpret. Uh, the Acropolis is probably the most interpretable because it's a combination of text and material culture. Uh, there would be buried rooms, one copy on the top, one on the surface, one copy deep underground that would contain all of the eventual scientific knowledge that we had about cancer, biology, nuclear physics, chemistry, metallurgy, and so on. Now, in the context of this, the Wilderness Act, how we understand not the contaminated lands, but the non-contaminated, the pure lands, 
enters into the discussion in an interesting way. The Wilderness Act was passed in the United States in 1964 as opposed to the park system. This was supposed to be something different, a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his works dominate the landscape is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. An area of wilderness is defined to mean in this act an area of undeveloped federal land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements managed and protected to preserve its natural conditions. This idea of going back to some primeval state is deep in the idea of wilderness as it was enacted into law. Now, sometimes the wastelands became wild lands. For instance, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, highly contaminated, became re-inhabited by hawks, owls, and other birds as the managers of that space uh, will inform you, uh, because it's been protected by, from human development by its toxicity. This is a theme that you see increasingly discussed in areas and one that I want to focus on. The Savannah River nuclear site, where the most contaminated nuclear site in the United States and where about a big portion of the plutonium was extracted, and they are now a cleanup site because they're not making plutonium anymore. They're trying to take this waste in these tanks, which is extremely toxic, as I mentioned, and, and to dry it out, to separate out the most radioactive materials, to mix it with sand, melt it into these canisters, which were then supposed to be shipped to Yucca Mountain. But when Yucca Mountain was canceled after $15 billion were put into it, um, they now have no place to go. Uh, and so these radioactive logs are put into the ground uh, in these sort of silos that you can uh, see at, at, uh, on the site. There are also where there are markers, underground radioactive material. And the site itself is enormous. It's over 300 square miles. And in that area, you see in its public graphics, for instance, um, the reactor where much of the plutonium, the, the, the radioactive rods were uh, produced. And you see alligators and school children and, Bambi and the set-aside DOE research area. Uh, so you, you even have uh, a large number of radioactive alligators. Uh, the big one on the left is known locally as Stumpy. Um, uh, and you have radioactive turtles and radioactive fish. And there's, uh, it's, but it, on the other hand, it's become one of the most biodiverse sites in the United States and one of the places in the world where the most um, uh, the greatest variety of water uh, insects, water-based insects, are uh, located. There are other places where wil wilderness ha has been turned inversely into, uh, where waste has been dumped into wilderness. There was a program that the Atomic Energy Commission ran for years in which they would take radioactive materials to the different ecological regions, one from the rainforest of um, Puerto Rico, another into the Arctic tundra, and so on, and to see what happened. In this uh, expedition, they were exposing the rainforest to cesium-137. Uh, Edward Teller wanted to detonate nuclear weapons in Alaska, uh, and when that failed, wanted to explore the effects of nuclear radioactive fallout material on the Alaskan coast. Uh, Teller underestimated the political connectedness of the local people at Ogatora Creek who called up the uh, Episcopal Church, who in turn got in contact with President Kennedy, who in turn told the Atomic Energy Commission that they were not going to blow up nuclear weapons in the Ogatora Creek. But you can also see in this, the, the, uh, what happens when a large-scale loss of containment takes place. Uh, we've seen that in the world in, many, in a series of accidents, in wind scale in uh, Britain, in um, Chernobyl, and more recently, um, in Fukushima, and Rob uh, and I have been filming in Fukushima uh, after the uh, triple meltdown, the earthquake, and then the tidal, the tidal wave, and then the, the uh, triple meltdown at the nuclear power plant. And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about in our discussion is what that area looks like. The problem of recontainment is 
infinitely harder than the already extremely difficult problem of how to keep containment of material that hasn't been dispersed. And so throughout the countryside around Fukushima, you see these large garbage bags filled with topsoil in an attempt to try to get it out. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's an astonishingly difficult uh, thing to try to do. Let me play a little clip from the film about an area not too far from Fukushima where uh, a cattleman is trying to struggle to figure out how to continue to live with the, the animals. There, there are signs up that say wild cattle, you know, danger, because it's, it's in a sense an area that's already reverting to a kind of wildness that it hasn't known in uh, centuries, maybe millennia. The problem of handling this relationship, this weirdly new relationship between wastelands and wilderness comes up in lots of different ways. One idea was to create a kind of nuclear priesthood. Thomas Seabook, who had been at the Department of Energy and at Bechtel, began to talk this way. He was often mocked in the press for talking about this. But he, his idea was that somehow you could hand down knowledge from generation to generation as if uh, the teachings of religious knowledge. Other people, like the deep ecologists, began to talk of sitting with toxics the way you might sit with wilderness. Taking care of nuclear and toxic wastes of all sorts, they wrote, will be a responsibility for humans for generations into the future, even if we were to stop mining and refining uranium immediately. This may mean sitting with toxic chemicals, sitting with attentiveness, not passively, as a type of caring practiced by Buddhists in some form of their meditation. You see ecologists talking and divers talking about the, using the nuclear destroyed ships in the South Pacific as a place to dive. This, they said, was the primeval wilderness that had not been seen for generations, diving the way it used to be, but now present, looking at primeval nature mixed with a kind of apocalyptic image of Japanese and American warships that had been sunk there in Operation Crossroads. There's a touristic industry that's growing, already quite huge, in which tourists go to places like the Trinity site uh, where the first nuclear weapon was detonated. Chernobyl uh, is a major tourist uh, and economically generative uh, community now for people coming in to be photographed in front of the so-called sarcophagus to compete over who can find the most radioactive hotspots and so on. Back to WIP, you could imag imagine uh, things had gone stably, but they didn't. About a year ago, there was a detonation uh, underground or a conflagration underground when somebody misinterpreted uh, the spoken word uh, inorganic for anorganic, and they switched the kitty litter being used to absorb the radioactive liquids in the radioactive waste from the good kitty litter filled with clay on the left to the organic kitty litter on the right. Unfortunately, the nitrate salt residues from the waste mixes with the organic sorbent in the sweet scoop natural clumping litter uh, which they were using and combined with some of the other um, neutralization agents to create a patented explosive. Um, people then began to think, well, maybe these, this whole way of talking to the future with monuments won't work, and we need to think about some kind of story that will persist beyond what we could imagine inscribing onto monuments. And only that, like religious or mythical legends and so on, could continue deep into the future. This is a, a frame from the film uh, in which a museum was created that people would continue to visit as a combination of instruction and entertainment. If that seems strange, perhaps it's less strange when you think that the Chernobyl Museum in Kiev uh, looks like this, and you can go to experience this, what looks like to me like a combination of a disco hall and a uh, grave site. Fukushima is already talking about building a combination museum amusement park. In other words, we are combining these aspects of our life, informing this idea of a waste wilderness, to think of ourselves neither as owning the land and of it for our exploitation, uh, nor as being romantic servants of the land, but as being in a way a kind of nuclear tourists, appreciating the highly biodiverse uh, land as if it was without us, but 
not visit not as owners but as visitors as tourists on an earth marked with monuments like these that crown it uh, with thorns uh, thank you so um, to, to properly introduce Rob Moss, uh, in, uh, the uh, documentary filmmaker um, who has worked with Peter now on two collaborations. So Containment is your second film together. And maybe bef before we talk about Containment and some of the issues it raises and also the, 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 the art of the film, it would be great maybe to understand uh, as Science Gallery is a place where art and science collide, and the, the two of you, in a way, embody that collision you know, as a, a filmmaker and a physicist and historian of science, uh, how did you two come to collide? Uh, what what uh, sparked your first collaboration? Um, Peter came to the department I teach in at Harvard, the Department of Visual and Environmental Studies, looking for somebody to partner with to think about teaching a course together <clears throat> that would engage filmmaking and science somehow. Um, and that course became um, what we've called uh, filming science. We've taught it over the last 15 years, uh, maybe every other year. Um, it's a course which means to um, think about what happens when you film science, what happens to filmmaking when you film science, what happens when you put unleash cameras in laboratories, for example, what happens to the science when it's filmed, how do these things integrate. Um, the course often has uh, scientists and sometimes filmmakers. Um, we read books. We used to write papers and make movies. Now we don't write papers. We read books and make movies. Um, and it's um, um, a pleasure to teach, and it's a, to, to co-teach it with Peter. Um, it also turned out to be a kind of its own kind of laboratory for each other um, that I think of classrooms as, um, as places where where partially formed ideas are negotiated. And that's exactly what uh, making a film is, and that's exactly what an editing room is, is you've got an idea, it's a partial idea, you're thinking about it out loud, how do you, how do you work through those ideas? Uh, Co-teaching is complicated, it's like so many things are going on, you have to read the room, you have to read the ideas, Who's, who do you follow, who do you, you know, who do you redirect? Uh, what kinds of ideas are the dominant ideas of a moment? These are ideas, these are like moments in classrooms that you have to negotiate directly and immediately, and Peter and I do that um, in, with a certain kind of pleasure, and it's that pleasure, I think, that led us to make movies together. And um, I've had the good fortune to see the whole of the containment film, uh, and I suppose um, possibly one of the only places in the world where you can do that right now is down the road in Project, where uh, it's the, the entire film is, is um, uh, being shown on, on a loop as part of the uh, Riddle of the Burial Grounds. Um, but what, one of the very strong themes in the film, and something that you brought out in your talk, Peter, is this question of the challenge of communicating across vast realms of time and communicating with the very distant future. And um, it seems that um, this is a, this question of uh, traveling across time or communicating across time is something that both of you have come at from different angles in your own careers. Um, I'm thinking of uh, your film, The Same River Twice, Rob, which is a, a wonderful film where people are confronted with this amazing episode from their youth where they went on a river rafting journey and uh, as you know serious accountants and things suddenly they're confronted with these images of wild abandon uh, in, in their past and then you Peter you've um, been fascinated by time uh, throughout your work uh, for example in your your book about Einstein's clocks and Poincare's maps mm -hmm. but also um, in collaborating with an artist like William Kentridge. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps you could talk a little bit about your fascination with time. Well, one of the things that's really fascinating to me about physics is that it sits already by the end of the 19th century as a discipline that speaks to philosophy uh, and after 1919 when Einstein becomes a household name when light is seen to be bent by the sun in a way predicted by the, theory, by the theory of general relativity. And then with World War II, you have the, suddenly the nuclear weapons, and physicists are then 
some way mediating between philosophy, questions of theology, questions of uh, state power and international relations, of secrecy, uh, that this is something that is amazing to me, that something, a set of equations, a group of people who start out as a fairly specialized branch of science suddenly seem to be confronting issues that span this space. And I, I think that time interests me because it is such a central notion in physics. Newton thought understanding time and space was the central purpose of his life and of his great masterwork, the Principia Mathematica. Einstein thought that reformation of time was the most important thing that he added to physics. Uh, time and space in the vicinity of a black hole are some of the great open questions to us today in physics. And time is always more than time. And I think, you know, there you could say there's some arcane bit of physics, sometimes even Nobel Prize winning high quality physics that has no influence at all on artists and architects and philosophers and theologians. But time is never just time. Time is always mortality and immortality of responsibility and communication of legacy and ancestry. And, and so I think that one of the things that Rob and I have uh, shared in making this film Secrecy that we did uh, that showed he, uh, through Tessa's, uh, Tessa Giblin's good auspices uh, some seven years ago uh, to, uh, in Dublin to, to uh, this film is we're interested in things that have a technical, real, scientific, technical component, something that's in the world, but also something that is dreamlike, otherworldly, philosophically demanding of us in some way. And nuclear waste is this crud, this horrible liquid in these tanks, and yet at the same time it makes us ask questions about how we govern ourselves, who gets to choose, is it the local town, is it the state, is it the region, is it the world, who gets to say what goes on at Chernobyl or Windscale or Fukushima, and then who, you know, when, when a town votes to bury nuclear waste there that's going to affect 10,000 or 100,000 or a million years into the future, um, what responsibilities do they have and how do you take into account the interests of generations unborn, civilizations uncreated? So I think that that's what one of the things that constantly appeals to us is somehow this back and forth between the very real issues that we face and this imaginative space of time. Uh, and in your case, Rob, uh, this idea, this sort of central conundrum of the film of, of how to uh, communicate across a failure of language, is, is that something that you're deeply interested in? Or? Sure. Um, two things to say. Um, one is, um, just quickly, and it's, it's about another kind of time, way to think about time. In this movie, The Same River Twice, um, I made a film in which people were going down a river for 35 days, often without clothes, and then 20 years later filmed them in their daily lives over four years, five people over four years, and intercut it with the old footage. And, and in that case, it's going from youth to middle age, which is another kind of time, and another way to think about time. And of course, it leads to mortality, and it is mm -hmm. this era of mortality that that film is actually about. Um, and in, in containment, um, I'm answering a slightly different question, but it's also in, the, in Peter's talk and in the piece that we showed. It was the moment that we, Peter and I, um, it, it was a realization that was a slow growing realization, which is we're in these landscapes um, in which you're, um, you're walking around these um, towns or these landscapes that have been destroyed by the earthquake and by the tsunami, perhaps both. And it's clearly that's what you're filming. Boats turned upside down and buildings that are sort of sitting there toppled over. And it's like the day after the earthquake, the day after the tsunami. And in a way, that's what you're filming. But that's not actually what you're filming because it's several years later and it's exactly the same as it was. And what you're filming is a radioactive environment which has disallowed anybody to return to fix them. And it's a different kind of catastrophe. It's a time catastrophe. It's a, it's a dislocation. It's a kind of distortion of the temporal field that once radioactivity is in the environment, everything slows down. Nothing can quite happen in a human scale. And filming the nothing happening is the kind of catastrophe it is. And that's also a problem of time. 
Yeah, I, I want to come back to Fukushima because I thought that that little clip of film that we saw was extremely powerful where there's this, these silent streets, uh, you know, the, this idea of a place where time has stopped yes. um, is incredibly poignant. And um, as you say, the, it's, it seems very difficult to sort of film nothing happening or to, to be making a film about things that by their That's nature are, by are the buried <laughs> in a way. You, you like opening, you like Pandora's box, you know, it's uh, from secrecy to, to this film. It seems to be your, uh, yeah, almost your trademark as a, as a film duo. What's, what's the, next, uh, the next big project for you? Well, we, we figured, you know, with secrecy, I remember when we first were talking about it, I said to Rob, hey, it's a great subject. Why don't we do, I've been writing about secrecy. Let's make a film about secrecy. And he said, so you mean we're going to make a film where nobody's going to talk to us. It's completely forbidden to show any images. There's no possibility of filming anything. And I say, yeah. And he said, that sounds like a great <laughs> film. <laughs> and with this film, you know, we struggled for a long time, I'm over a year, to get down into the into the mines underground. I, I don't think I showed uh, any footage of that, but where they're burying the waste. And um, and then Fukushima itself was complicated. I mean, not only neither of us speak Japanese, so that was, you know, we had to figure out how to film and edit in a language we don't know. Uh, and But then it was just, you know, worrying about safety and the crew's safety and I mean, I had Geiger counters. We had film badges and various kinds of outfits to wear, and it was uh, so it was, it was difficult and and very moving. I mean, we saw people like the cattle rancher that I, I showed you a, a clip from from our film, um, and others who we were struggling often to to go back to this site. But one of the things about the way that that time gets stopped is that for a long time after the accident, maybe a year and a half, they didn't know whether the fuel the pool where the fuel was, the damaged fuel was located could fall over or not. If it had, it would have been a complete catastrophe. I mean, that was the thing that the Prime Minister of Japan was terrified about, that they could actually catch fire and cause the end of modern Japan. So people had to stay away for a while. And now sometimes people, after the fact, say, well, why don't these people go back? I mean, the radioactivity level is not that high. And, but you go to these houses, and there's black mold, and there's, you know, rot in the walls. Houses don't do well by themselves. And nothing uh, man-made does. And so uh, that became something that really we only felt deeply by being there with some of the people that you saw, like the young woman in the film who would go back. There's an older man who goes back every other day, but he can't. There are no doctors. There's no schools. There's no, you know, the playgrounds have giant Geiger counters in them. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it just tell people that they ought to move back to, the, to, the, to this place now because the gamma radiation has gone down, because the cesium-137 has decayed a lot, is, is very unrealistic. And it's unsympathetic. It's unempathetic to, the, to what it actually would mean to be. You could walk on the streets, and there's a child's bicycle. And a, I found a, a, I mean, I, I, the little girl's wallet is opened up. And you see her, you know, her little pictures in it and, you know, that have been sitting there for two, two years. And, um, it, 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 was, it really is a weird, like a kind of science fiction film where everyone's been beamed away somehow. Uh, and is it true that Fukushima happened while the project was already underway? And how, how did that change what, how you approached the whole idea? Um, yes, we had been working for a couple of years. Um, you know, starting with this idea about warning the future, I think it was the, one of the originating ideas, and that meant filming in the waste isolation pilot plant, getting access to film there, going underground, trying to make sense of that. What are the processes of actually holding on to nuclear waste and doing something with it? Led to the Savannah River site. And while we were in the midst of doing that, um, these three plants melted down. And that was in uh, 2011. In 2013, we went. Um, and then it took us another year and a half to integrate the Japanese material. The Japanese material, if, if, if the waste isolation pilot plant and the Savannah River site are examples of trying to contain and trying to stop it from getting out in the future, uh, Fukushima is an example of the future coming to the present and it happening and what happens to a contaminated landscape. How do we, how do we regard a contaminated landscape? What does that even look like? What are we actually talking about when we're in one? And the film wants to explore that. Um, I wanted to ask your last, answer your last question, perhaps, that in secrecy, one of the problems in secrecy was how does secrecy affect uh, uh, democracy? And you don't know it, but you feel it. It's like gravity. 
Um, it's like in the world, and you can imagine it's in the world, but it's by inference, since you can't point the camera at it, as Peter was describing. And in filming radiation, you can't film the radiation, but you can film the aftermath of the radiation, what that looks like, and that distortion. So um, we're thinking about making a film about black holes, and I was also thinking you could add dark matter to that. Like, I'm not a physicist. There are physicists in the room. I'm going to tread into territory. I'm going to like totally embarrass myself. But I understand that you know that the phenomena doesn't exactly work without this inferred idea of this other kind of matter. And you know, how do you point a camera at that? Yeah, dark matter does seem like a logical next step. Does seem like the next. Step. Well, we could film the interior of a black hole. We just wouldn't be able to show you it. <laughs> It's very striking when you see the footage of the Savannah River site and, you know, these beautiful wetlands and, uh, you know, uh, people with turtles and so on. It, it does look like a, you know, a beautiful nature documentary un until suddenly people say, well, this, this turtle has cesium and, uh, uh, and in fact, it turns out that um, it is in no way a paradise. Uh, so, um, I mean, how deliberate is that on your part in sort of creating that tension in the film between sort of uh, this idea of a natural wilderness paradise and this um, uh, dark uh, hidden secret beneath the land? Well, I think there are two sides of it. One is that the way we make films together is we're not interested in, in uh, lambasting people and making people look like you know, parodying them or making them look like idiots because we actually are very sympathetic to the people struggling to work in this environment, often dangerous environment. And I mean, there's one person who we both came to respect and, and like a lot, the head scientist at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. His father was a uh, uranium miner and he devoted his life to trying to clean up this, the aftermath of, of this nuclear epoch. And he, you know, so he's struggling to do this. And in a, in a way, what we see, our, we see this problem of nuclear waste and secrecy too as in some ways rather tragic situations. Namely, they've, they, they've gotten so big, these difficulties. We've gotten us to a place where there isn't an easy answer. You know, you can't just say, okay, look, I don't want to make any more nuclear power. You still would have 70 years of nuclear materials to deal with. Uh, you can't deal with the society. You don't, we don't really want to find on the internet how to make binary chemical weapons that uh, every undergraduate can make in their uh, home chemistry lab. I mean, that's probably not in our best interest. So the idea of, of, of these problems that are bigger than us in many ways, it's not to say there's nothing to do. It's just to say that we have to, to try to understand the, the difficulties, the of these issues, that the, what this waste represents for us in questions of governance. Who votes? I mean, you think, say, okay, well, it's a democratic question. For whom? The town? They support it. They're 80% for the, the, you know, burying the waste there. But does the state get to vote? Does the north part of the state that doesn't benefit financially get to vote? Mexico is very close. Mexico is closer than the northern part of the state. Does Mexico get to vote? Um, we don't even have the political apparatus in the world to do that, to say, the French get to vote about German nuclear power or vice versa. We have laws that say you can't export nuclear waste. And the Dutch say, really? We're below sea level. You want us to have nuclear waste here? Um, there are lots of questions that our, our political institutions are completely inadequate to address. And I think that part of the style of the film and our kind of filmmaking is to try to understand with some kind of empathy our situation now, our collective situation, where we've gotten ourselves and what that opens up. And that means in the visual quality of the film, not trying to, you know, to, to recognize that some of these spaces are highly biodiverse, very beautiful to look at, and very contaminated. And that you know, it's not as if you're saying, oh, it's OK because it's biodiverse. Let's go ahead and make more nuclear waste. It's just saying that this is the situation we've got into. It's bigger than us, and it has these very complicated, unintuitive aspects. I wanted to just. I'm, Sorry, Michael John. I was like, um, Ozu made films in Japan um, often about very precise moments in the season, early spring or late summer. Um, and these human dramas against these very particular moments in a season. And there was something about, and intentional, and something we could experience. The color green in May in Japan is so beautiful. It's so beautiful the way the colors are rendered. And to have those colors um, 
radioactive at the same time uh, was so poignant and so heartbreaking um, uh, that it was, part of, it was part of the palette of the film. We mean it to be part of the vocabulary of the film. And we did very early on. I mean, initially when we were filming in the desert, it seemed that the landscapes of the desert, where underneath is this radioactive material. But above ground is this desert, and the desert has a certain quality, and you feel a certain way in it. And there's a certain color palette above ground. There's a certain color palette in Fukushima, a certain color palette in the Savannah River site. And that color palette becomes a signifier somehow of the radiation or the mix of the two things, of the, the air in your face and the color on the above ground and the radioactivity below ground. And it, there also seems to be an amount of humor in the film, which is awkward or uncomfortable in a film about nuclear waste. Um, the, the scenes... It's like physics jokes. It's like <laughs> <laughs> nuclear but jokes. The, the scenes in Carlsbad where you have the, the local community uh, coming together and saying, you know, we're, you know, we're really proud that we have uh, all of this uh, nuclear waste and we really think we're ready now for high level nuclear waste. Uh, we want to kind of upgrade. Uh, and <laughs> it just, it's, it's, it seems like a piece of speculative fiction. It, it, it seems uh, um, absolutely difficult to, to comprehend. Um, and, it, and it's such a contrast to what, you know, then the Fukushima situation, you know, these proud local citizens who are then like looking at the, what happened in Yucca Mountain when the project was stopped and they're saying, you know, such a pity they couldn't get the local community to really buy into it in Yucca Mountain, that, you know, those people, they really missed out. Um, it, talk about the humor. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a complicated question because, um, I mean, human beings are never more comical when, than when they're self-interested. Um, that's part of our human comedy. Um, yet, there's something deeply true about things like a town about to go bankrupt because it can't support itself anymore. Um, that's a real problem. And um, this idea of bearing nuclear waste um, rejuvenates the town. It actually does rejuvenate the town. Um, young families move back to the town. Um, uh, PH, there's more PhDs in Carlsbad than anywhere in the country except for um, Los Alamos. Los Alamos. Um, as a percentage of the as, population. <laughs> right, not as an absolute number. And, and how amazing is that? And that, you know, the town was completely rejuvenated by this. But it's a kind of bargain you make, a kind of bargain with the future, and a bargain with commerce, and a, a bargain with, you know, your immediate self-interest. And that produces a certain kind of comedy. It's exactly comedy. It's a certain kind of irony. Um, and it's a kind of irony that just like it's ironic to try to imagine 10,000 years in the future, like you can't really do it. You know you can't do it. You have to do it anyway. They're giving it their best guess. Uh, we have to render that in some kind of cartoon form so it's not taken too seriously, like they really mean it, yet that doesn't dismiss it at the same time, because it's actually a genuine enterprise, and it is a real problem. And the film tries to kind of deal with you know, both those things by acknowledging the irony and the comedies, but in a kind of larger kind of human comedy sort of way, rather than in a jokey or sarcastic sort of way. I mean, I, I think that, you know, and I'm glad that you, you thought there were funny parts in it, because we really, we see that. And we think that's part of that kind of dark humor of the film that's not a, a um, you know, the people who are in the situation often understand very well how, how wild it, their situation is, right? How that the futurists who are trying, struggling to predict five years or six years or eight years ahead, being asked to think of 10,000 years. And they know this is wrong. There's something crazy about it, but they can't say no, because the waste has to go somewhere, and what kind, what are you gonna do? And they believe that it should. One guy says, I'm a card-carrying member of the Sierra Club, and you know, I, I, I'm an environmentalist, but, but this waste has to go somewhere. What am I gonna do to help? And that sense of radioactive turtles and fish cattle and you know the, the whole thing is so outsized to us that there's a kind of there is a dark humor but it's a specific kind of humor that we, we didn't want to make it just mocking you know group a and sanctifying group b well i'm shortly going to open it up to the audience but um so get your questions ready but um before i do that i one other aspect of the film that i found really interesting was this parallel between communicating with extraterrestrial intelligence uh, and communicating across time. And it's, it's interesting, uh, even today in the New York Times, there's a big piece about this Russian uh, 
entrepreneur who has pledged $100 million today uh, to support communication with extraterrestrial intelligence. So um, this is a very live issue. Uh, and you had Drake in the film. We were talking earlier about uh, Drake and the, the likelihood of communication with uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, but that parallel and the, 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 the challenge of Voyager and so on seems to be also a, a strong element of the film. Can you talk about that a little? Well, it, it's not only a parallel, it's the same people that worked on trying to make the Voyager record. The illustrator for that record becomes the main, main, one of the main illustrators for these monuments. Drake, who was, whose eponymous equation is up on one of, on one of your exhibits here, uh, is the, is, is, and was in charge of choosing the 115 images that went on the side of Voyager, uh, was in charge of choosing a, a part of this project of burying nuclear waste too. And they often thought, well, you know, at least we're communicating with our own species and it's 10,000 years, not billions of years into the future. Um, this ought to be easier, actually. And our message is pretty simple. It, don't dig here. Uh, but even that turned out to be daunting and in all sorts of ways. Once you, you remove any assumption that we're gonna have a language in common, pictorial vocabulary in common, uh, the same kind of society, and once you start to get out to million years and you're in evolutionary time, even the same sorts of bodies and brains. So it's a very difficult uh, problem, but in a way, um, fascinating. And it also, the, the, the other parallel is with the monuments of Japan saying, don't, don't build here. Uh, which is, in a sense, we are their future, as uh, uh, Mr. Inamura says in the film. You know, they, they made these for us. We are the future. We are, the, we are like those future beings that we are trying to communicate with, or those aliens. And what do we do? We build below the monuments. You know, we don't listen. And it's there, like, there's nobody that's trying to um, experiment on other species on Earth in terms of you know, keeping moles out and things like that, uh, as opposed to <laughs> aliens. That's not really a trend. Well, in it? Hanford, they, they have, <laughs> one of their problems is that they built these big asphalt surfaces over some of the worst radioactive salts. But it turns out that bunny rabbits like the salt. They like to eat it. So they, and rabbits are good at digging. So the rabbits dug underneath the asphalt caps, and they ate the salt, and they come out, and they poop radioactive pellets on the surface. So there are these helicopters that go around with guys in radioactive suits and scooping up the radioactive bunny poop. I mean, I didn't make it up. <laughs> so I'm afraid we're going to have to end the conversation there for tonight. I'd like to thank the Science Gallery team and thank Project Art Center and Tessa Gibbon uh, for uh, the wonderful partnership on this event and on uh, bringing uh, Peter and Rob to Dublin, and I'd like finally to ask you to join me in thanking Peter Gallison and Rob Moss. Thanks.